<laughs> Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, to uh, uh, bring it in line with um, things that are happening uh, within the affected communities. So uh, just to say that. <clears throat> the Portland metro area, including Beaverton, rest on traditional village sites of the Kalapuya, Multnomah, Wasco, Cowlitz, Kathlamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Malala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River and its tributaries. We recognize the systemic policies of genocide, relocation, and assimilation that still impact many indigenous Native American families today. We thank these tribes for being stewards and protectors of these lands for thousands of years. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. It just it's it's really meaningful and I, I really appreciate the work that you've done in getting us started on this and that you've done in conjunction with Dory as the refining process goes on. Joy, it's all yours. Yes, did all uh, voting members receive a copy of the minutes from last month that Spencer um, submitted? Is, are there any corrections? Hearing none, I make a motion that the minutes be approved as sent. Is there a second? I'll second it. Great. I also saw Tanya, so we have a third. Okay. So the motion on the floor is to adopt the minutes from last month. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, lower your hand. All opposed, raise your hand. Are there any abstentions? Motion carries. Cool. Thank you so much. Um, no public comment right now. Uh, so we could go ahead and move on. Um, so I know Council is in, is in Texas for a wedding. She said she would try to jump in, but I'm gonna assume that that wedding is too hype right now. And so that's why she's not here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you, Lieutenant Steinworth. All right, good evening, I have a whole lot. It sounds like before we uh, started the meeting, uh, there was some mention of the Pride event. Uh, I think it was very successful. I stopped by, uh, my wife and I did, and we had obviously some police participation. We had a booth, uh, and uh, for all intents and purposes, it sounds like it went very well with everyone for being the first event for the uh, city in a long, long time. It was refreshing to be out around folks and, and doing stuff around the library like we did. You know, it seemed like a, a decade ago, so it, it was pretty cool. And uh, we got a lot of good feedback. Uh, the traffic wasn't a problem. Every, everything went off uh, fairly smoothly. So very pleased with that. Um, the only other thing I really on the horizon here as far as events go is uh, National Night Out. We're doing a different National Night Out this year. It's kind of a hybrid. We're not gonna have stuff at the library after I just talked about having fun stuff at the library. But uh, it's gonna be kind of your own neighborhood. So if your neighborhood's having some type of event and, and they wish to have some officers come by and. Uh, socialize a little bit, maybe bring some swag, uh, talk to the kids, uh, talk to the neighbors. Um, it'll, it'll be a more intimate event. Um, you can go online uh, to request that. Yeah. Consuela Star, I, I think you've met, she'll, uh, she'll arrange all that kind of stuff. So that's what we're going to try this year. Hopefully next year we'll be back to normal and doing it um, you know, in a larger scope uh, at a city park uh, or library. But that's mailbox community services. Well, I'll just say it's a long uh, email, so I'll just I'll put it in the chat for everyone. So if so if you and your neighbors are having something you'd like us to come by, we'd love to come by. Just, uh, you know, let us know. Thank you. So, Lieutenant, if if the can you say that last part again, if in your neighborhood, if you're if the neighbors are having some event, we'd, we'd like you to come over. You're, well, yeah, so, so in the past, national night out, it was usually the, na the national night out, neighbors come out, they, they celebrate public safety. It's not about police, it's about the neighborhoods and getting to know your neighbors and, you know, because knowing your neighbors are safe neighbors and so on and so forth. And, and obviously the police department gets involved. 
Uh, it evolved through the years to a big event that we'd have at the park. But now there, there are some neighbor, neighborhoods that celebrate the, the National Land Out event. So rather than um, having a centralized event, we're going back to the old model of uh, going out to the neighborhoods and, and uh, chatting with, with the different neighborhoods and, and getting to know people. A more, like I said, a more intimate event. Great, thank you. Thanks, Lieutenant. Um, it's funny, you're not at your office anymore, but that sound keeps following you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm sorry about that. And I, I, I was monkeying with it for about a half hour before uh, the, the meeting, and I, I just don't know. Uh, I think it's time for a new computer. I work, I work for the government. What, what can I say? <laughs> uh, uh, cool. Um, Amy, I know you're in summer right now, but I'm not sure if there's any updates you'd like to share uh, from Emmy Abbey Youth. Yeah, so I mean, we're on our summer break right now, but I do just want to say I was able to sit in on the interviews for the new um, MYAB members, and I'm so excited about what we'll be doing next year. Um, everyone is super passionate, so um, I'm really optimistic. Cool, cool, cool. Let us know how that goes. Um, and I think, uh, too, one of, one of the things that I know there is a big push this year for a lot of the recruitment. And so I think that a track is a place, too, where you could lean on for additional recruitment for that. I know we have educators in here as well as parents. Um, the other thing I just want to say, I, I ordered Joy mentioned shirts earlier. So Spencer had sent over a design for some tie dye shirts and the original request was let's get a few shirts so that we could use it for pride. Um, I just went ahead and got everybody shirts. Um, so that includes you as well, Amy and Lieutenant. Um, I would love to see, uh, I think the tack vests that BPD wear are really cool, but I think uh, tie dye underneath would be really cool to see. And I think Lieutenant Steinworth could lead the way. That's just a proposal. Um, and then, th yep, there it is. There it is right there. So huge thank you, Spencer, for uh, that was a good idea. I haven't been spending your food money anywhere, so that was a great place to, to spend it. Um, it. So I have shirts for everybody. Uh, well, you'll just coordinate with me and how you actually get that shirt. You're more than welcome to stop by the city hall building. Um, if you weren't here earlier when Joy had mentioned, uh, apparently the shirts are leaking or or they're they're like, yeah, they're leaking, right? Isn't that what you said? They run, they're tie dyed. So they'll run. run, like I was pouring water on myself at Pride and running. So my shorts got all tie dyed too, which was fine, but it washes right out. So give it a wash. Yep. And I don't think during that day it would have matter if you're pouring yourself water on yourself or not, quite frankly. <laughs> so hot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, for the city update, so there was a few that I sent your way already, but the one I'm going to choose to highlight because I'm so stoked about, uh, the Beerton Night Market is back in person this year. Um, so I, I'm not sure if y'all have been part of the Night Market before or have attended before, but it's an event that it can... Um, so it always attracts several thousand people each night. And so this year it's going to be on Southwest First Street and Southwest Tucker. Uh, so it's kind of like a block party, if you will. Um, and it's going to be on Friday, August 13th, and then Saturday, August 14th. So it's back to back this time, not um, every Saturday, or uh, Saturday, not two Saturdays like it was in the past. So, um, yeah, if you want any more information on that or want some uh, want to know who are some of the vendors that are going to be there, beavertonoregon.gov slash night market. I will say too, if you are on the Facebook, uh, you could just search that event, type, or I think you say going, right, or interested, one of those things, and then you get all the updates uh, for that event and often the updates also include uh, sneak peeks from vendors and performers of who is going to be there, so totally encourage you all to go to the night market. I will be there. Um, that's all I've got. Any other questions before we move on? Cool. I love the efficiency. All right. Spencer? I'm here. Well, we are looking forward to hearing your legislative bill recap that was a that was an important piece that you send out and i appreciate you taking the time to summarize it for us pleasure uh, and while spencer is looking for that i'll just also echo thank you spencer for doing this none of us asked and spencer just said hey i have all this information as it pertains to 
uh, the recommendations. So thank you, Spencer, for just taking that on on your own. Well, um, I think it just shows um, the timing was right because while we were doing, while we were concluding our work, um, uh, legislators were introducing bills that um, impact policing across the state. So um, you all received with the minutes and stuff, a brief outline. I thought I'd just provide a little bit more detail. So Senate Bill 204, um, which discusses access to police reports, it allows civilian or community oversight boards that are designated to investigate um, officer misconduct to access the law enforcement data system, uh, which includes police encounters and arrests, and it goes into effect January 1st. Um, this most um, clearly uh, intersects with our recommendation 2A regarding a, dash, a data dashboard, but um, also with 2E regarding oversight in that we're recommending an oversight board be established and then this would uh, impact how that operates. Senate Bill 621, Civilian Oversight Agencies. Um, it makes, it, it upholds local laws on community oversight boards that are set up to oversee uh, police discipline and other things. Um, so it, again, it's, uh, it intersects or brushes against our recommendation to we regarding oversight. And once an oversight board is um, uh, established by the city, um, then the, it'll be recognized as legal by the state. House Bill 2162 deals with police training and accreditation. Um, it directs the Department of Public Safety Standards and Training to develop a statewide equity training program for police officers. Um, and it, go, it goes on um, about adding people to the to the Board of Public Safety. Um, this is also where it, it hits us a little bit. Provides that police officer certification may be denied, suspended, or revoked if an officer has been fired for use of excessive force, abuse of authority, or discriminating, discriminatory uh, policing. So th this um, intersects with our recommendation 3A and B regarding hiring and retaining um, officers from underrepresented groups. Um, and certainly one A and C, um, A being um, A can't wait regarding escalated force. Um, I missed that one in the outline. Um, House Bill 2417, crisis intervention. Um, this intersects with 1B regarding funding social services. Um, it doesn't exactly fall into that, but um, it's certainly something worth discussing because it requires OHA, the Oregon Health Authority, to provide grants to cities to fund community mental health programs to operate within, to operate mobile crisis intervention teams. Um, it will require the OHA to establish a center to receive calls, texts, and chats. I'm sorry, yeah, chats from the 988 suicide prevention line. It's effective July 1st, which was like last week, so it's already in force. And it provide and it's a and it and there's a $15 million cost. Um, it drew bipartisan support across uh, ac across both houses. Um, House Bill 2575 um, also touches on 1B regarding funding social services. Um, this bill it, it regard, is regarding trauma-informed training, directs the Department of Justice to establish a program for awarding grants to law enforcement agencies and cities to train groups that interact with people who have experienced trauma. Um, this was overwhelmingly approved by both houses. Um, it, is directly, it directly impacts our recommendation. Um, and because um, it provides uh, monies to cities and agent to, and law enforcement agencies, I suspect that we have to apply um, as a city or as um, uh, 
a police uh, as a law enforcement agency. So that needs to be figured out and figured out right now because it's already in force and um, people are lining up and we need to get in line. Trauma informed training, I can't imagine anything more critical. And money, funds to actually do something with. That's great yeah. news. But we have to raise our hand and ask, I suspect. Yeah. And a million dollars is not a lot of money to, um, it, it'll be interesting to see how um, how people go after this. Trauma-informed care can be very intensive. And are we going to be doing this with officers or with, I didn't quite understand where the money's gonna go to, what groups are gonna be trained. Got it. Um, with that in mind, um, I'm presenting this with an eye toward um, which of us, who of us, all of us um, can pick a favorite bill mm -hmm. or two and show up on a Tuesday evening at city council to point out to council um, exactly how the bill um, is is affected by our um, by our report and recommendations. Uh, House Bill 2929, duty to intervene. Um, that's a slam dunk for um, eight can't wait. Requires a police officer who witnesses another officer engaging in misconduct or a violation of the state's minimum moral fitness standards to report it to a supervisor within 72 hours. A, poli a police agency must complete an investigation within three months and report findings of misconduct that rise above minor violations to the state. That won't be effective until till January, um, uh, but obviously um, uh, BPD will need to uh, work on that. And um, city council needs to know it's coming, it's there. House Bill 2930 um, places restrictions on arbitrators. Um, you may have noticed last week that uh, in Portland, uh, an officer who was fired last year for uh, misconduct uh, was reinstated um, this past week or was ordered reinstated uh, by the arbitrator on the case. So um, this restricts uh, the power of arbitrators, re requires arbitrators to uphold disciplinary decisions by a police agency <clears throat> unless the arbitrator finds they were, quote, arbitrary and capricious. So um, this is a move in a direction toward uh, maintaining discipline that personally I find really cool. So um, that takes effect upon the governor's signature, which could be any second. Um, so once again, city council needs to be made aware that this um, uh, is all over us. Um, uh, our recommendation, our recommendations one A, B, and C regarding transparency um, certainly come closest to uh, to this particular bill. House Bill twenty nine thirty two use of force reports. Um, once again, um, an A can't wait slam dunk. So, but also uh, 1C um, uh, es regarding escalating force. This bill directs law enforcement agencies to participate in the FBI's national use of force data collection and directs cr the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission to analyze the F by FBI data and report annually to the, legisl to the legislature. It's effective in Jan uh, January 1. House Bill 2936, background checks, directs the Depar uh, Department of Public Safety Standards and Training to create a uniform back background check checklist and a standardized personal history questionnaire for people applying to become public safety officers. Um, our recommendation uh, number three and its subparts is all regarding hiring of officers. Uh, that's effective already as it was effective July 1st. Um, so everybody in the city needs to be aware of that, including uh, council and BPD. 
House Bill 2986 um, is regarding bias crimes training. Once again, that's our uh, Numer that's our Roman numeral three regarding training. Directs the state's police training academy to train police to identify, report, and investigate crimes motiv motivated by prejudice based on perceived race, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, marital status, political affiliation or beliefs, membership or activity in or behalf of labor organizations or against a labor organization, uh, physical or mental uh, disability, age, economic, or social status, or citizenship of the victim. Um, so regarding training, uh, BPD will need to be brought up to speed on that, and certainly City Council um, needs to be very much aware of it uh, for policy purposes. That becomes effective January 1st. House Bill 3145 um, regarding misconduct records. This um, uh, uh, comes up against our um, recommendations to A, B, and C regarding transparency. It, requ it requires a police agency to report within 10 days to the Department of Public Safety and Standards if an officer is suspended or faces any disciplinary economic sanction. Um, so uh, that's our recommendation regarding transparency. Um, that's it as far as I can tell regarding intersections between our report and recommendations and the bills that passed. There are a couple um, that caught my eye. House Bill 3059 regards unlawful assembly. Mm -hmm. It sets out that a sheriff, deputies, a mayor, or executive officer may order, may order people to disperse if any five or more people assemble unlawfully. If people don't disperse, they may um, uh, then the people, then the officers may arrest people for unlawful activity, but they're not required to do so. House Bill 3265 um, is regarding sanctuary policies. Um, prohibits police from denying. And I'm not sure how it really applies because uh, Beaverton's um, identified as a sanctuary city, um, and I'm not far enough into the weeds on that definition to un quite understand. Um, but this prohibits police from denying services, benefits, privileges, et cetera, to people ba uh, on the basis of federal civil immigration actions. Um, it prohibits inquiring about a person's cit um, citizenship status uh, without connection to a criminal investigation. And probably most important, prohibits providing inform prohibits providing information about someone in custody to a federal immigration authority or using public resources to assist federal immigration enforcement. Um, that's effective upon the, gov the governor's signature, so that's that could be any second. Um, I think you guys can see how those might um, apply to the work that we do in general. Finally, I have a mea culpa. Um, we've spent a lot of time talking about um, uh, school resource officers, and we're very much aware that um, that the city has kicked that over to the um, uh, school district, which will be conducting about a 12-month um, uh, research project with consultants and doing um, interviews and surveys of parents and students and teachers and administrators. Um, in order for the for the school district to decide what they want to do about SROs, my um, legislative you know my legislative bill search um, was based on searching for the keyword of police. It never occurred to me until last weekend that I might take a look at uh, using a keyword as of schools. <laughs> there was Senate Bill two thirty eight was introduced, it would have prohibited school districts from contracting with law enforcement agencies to provide SROs. It died in the Senate Education Committee, and I couldn't tell if there was even a hearing, but can we all imagine one or two of our crew here, or not here tonight, um, testifying 
and the kind of impact that that would have had. I can't. If it had passed, we wouldn't be waiting for the school district to do a study and the police department would be saving a million dollars. That's it for me. Thank um, you. Thank again, you. I would love to see mm -hmm. many or all of us uh, taking the bills that we find most interesting uh, to city council for public, for public uh, remarks. Thank you, Spencer. That was a lot of research. And it, it, when, when you initially brought this forward, I was startled by um, how many of our recommendations actually coincided with legislature that is, is now in place. Kathy? Yes, I'm wondering if there's a way for Spencer to get on the agenda to just walk the city council through this as you just walked us through it. Um, well, I, I don't know, um, Councillor Hassan might. Um, I would have, you know, I think individually we get three minutes um, to talk. Lots of uh, branches of the city and county government come and make small presentations at city council. And I know we did the same thing when we presented our report, didn't we? Yes. And Six months ago. Yes. And as they're a bit behind, council is, and you just presenting this would be a non aggressive way of just bringing it up a bit. They've been wondering um, what went on in the legislature. They don't individually keep up with it. Right, at their last, um, at the meeting last week, which was a round table, uh, it was, um, th this subject so. was mentioned um, and it wasn't exactly blown off, but it was made clear that the council was going to have staff and the city attorney's office um, uh, review all of that. And at some point in the future, undefined, um, present a report. Mm -hmm. Yes. Can oh. we as a commissioner request a, um, a timeline that we would like to see it in six months or as a commission? We're concerned that this, you know, may be put on a back burner and concerned that it moves forward quicker than later. Joy, you've been all over the council for a while. Yeah, I, I kind of haunt them. And I'm gonna talk later. Um, I have some questions for them, of course. I, I like to ask good questions. I don't usually get any answers. Um, I also would just say, short of getting on the agenda, which for many reasons is problematic at the moment, I would say when you go to the city of Beaverton, the city council page, there's a place where you can click and send an email. It sends it to all of the city council members, the mayor's office and the city attorney's office. So if you happen to have questions about stuff like, gosh, what is the, the question I have here? What is the process in place to implement new state laws? Or how did, how does, how are you bringing this up? Or we made these recommendations. You can send an email and everyone gets it. And if we, and if many people say, send it and everyone gets it pretty soon, they can't ignore us to death anymore. And at last we're joined by the woman who knows stuff. Yes. <laughs> Don't feel alone. That was fun. Thank you. And we're, we're hopeful also to get an update too. So you may have um, some words of wisdom to share with us about this topic, but we're, we'll circle back also because we'd like to get the liaison update. Yes, um, so 
First of all, um, I will confess I am in Texas. Um, it's uh, we have a, a family wedding this week, so I'm actually up in a, a bedroom hiding from um, the four the first night of many that is uh, wedding celebrations. Um, but I knew I had to be there, be here for at least as much as I could be, um, because I know many of you watched the meeting, which felt like a year ago now, but I would say two weeks ago. Um, and I would share, obviously, if I you know didn't in that meeting or if you didn't sense it, obviously my disappointment as well. Um, I felt like there was a moment where we started reading your recommendations, which I didn't feel like we had really done to talk about them because I don't know that we've really done that as a council. So I was um, a little bummed that we didn't really go through that process. That said, um, <laughs> just listening to Spencer I think what I'm going to do is try to get a recap from someone within staff around how the specific House bill, um, things that passed around police reform, how those will be implemented. Because we know that that needs to happen. It's not that it doesn't, it's just a matter of someone doing it. Um, so a to-do that I have uh, personally is to kind of reach out to figure out who I would direct and or get that information from. Wouldn't it be the city attorney? I think so. Um, probably in partnership with um, maybe someone from the ledge staff and or BPD. Uh, I will say I don't know for sure. I do think that a lot of this in sort of flux continues quite honestly, and I, I feel like a broken record, but I'll just say it is we are in an interim city manager, even in this moment, we don't necessarily have, Kurt is our interim city manager, um, but he is kind of in two uh, places because uh, he's, he's supporting us right now sort of um, as interim, but, but truly on his way in, in transitioning out his role to the new city manager who will start at the end of August. Um, I, I did feel like when I saw the oversight bills or some stuff around, there was like a specific bill around oversight and oversight commission that it was providing some direction around what we could do or should do. So I'm hopeful to have a conversation with a couple different people to get that moving. I actually think that that's something that can, that, that can probably move um, or I would like to make that move if I can. Um, I would add just on the comments of like ways to lobby or ways to speak up. If you would like to send a letter as a group, uh, you are certainly welcome to. If you want to email us individually, you are also welcome to do that as I believe Spencer or Joy mentioned, uh, citymail at beavertonoregon.gov is a, um, a mechanism to reach all of us. Those emails do get forwarded to us directly to make sure that we see them. I don't know that they get sent to the mayor as well. So it might be worth adding the mayor mail email address as well. I don't know about next Tuesday's agenda in terms of like the robustness of it. I do, it's my understanding a lot of stuff is moving really quickly. And because we've sort of are in this interim, interim city manager, we're trying to, a bunch of people are trying to get a bunch of things on the agenda to make sure that things get addressed. So one of those things is ARPA funding um, because we um, have, have received some of our ARPA funding and have yet to identify how we'll be using ARPA funding. The other thing I did want to make sure I, I gave you an, an opportunity um, just to kind of to put out there um, is we did have that sort of special emergency meeting last Wednesday, which was a discussion on uh, fireworks and the banning of fireworks in the city. Uh, Council chose not to move forward with the ban. A um, lot of different reasons why. I think enforcement was a big part of it. Uh, I also think the city limits are more complicated than people realize. Um, you could be on 185th and TV Highway and suddenly you're not in the city of Everton. So what does that look like? So I, I just, I, it's very important to me that you all feel like you can have access to me or ask me questions or come to me with your concerns. I will do my best to try to continue to move them forward. Um, but I wanted to, to give this space today to make sure if you had questions or comments that you could. So I'll pause now and um, see if you have any comments or questions. Regard, oh, did you ask for questions? Yeah, go ahead, Spencer. Um, 
I forgot to raise my hand. Um, regarding um, oversight and your enthusiasm for it, um, I think mine and perhaps a couple other people's concern is that um, it will be made subject to a lengthy consultancy uh, contract um, in order for, um, I don't know, in order for uh, counselors to feel comfortable that they're doing the right thing. Um, certainly, um, I think we'd prefer to see it happen sooner than that, but you, you know, we all know how long that can take. So what, what are your thoughts? I will say one of the things that excited me about Jemmy was the work that she had done around police advisory work in Tracy. I don't know the detail of that work. I believe it was my understanding from her materials that she submitted that it was in response to everything. Uh, please don't quote me for 100%, but I got the impression that she had really been able to rally community and put some work together around it. So that's what I was excited about and continue to be excited about. So I think what the challenge will be, Spencer, to be super honest with you, is who gets to sit on that and how and why, right? So do we let Spencer sit on it? Maybe I don't want Spencer on it, right? And do I get to choose, right? Does, does the chief of police get to choose? Like that I think is like probably, probably where we're gonna see the most sort of contentious conversation because you can make a, a border commission be what you want it to be, or you can make a border commission representative of the voices that you wanna hear. And that I think will be an obstacle, which we will have to get through when that time comes. I'd be curious if you if you or others had thoughts on cities who have um, done oversight well. I think while we look at Portland a lot, Portland still is not the sort of um, had it, like people don't necessarily see Portland as the the like the example. And so I'm always looking for cities and municipalities that have done it differently or have a similar makeup to Beaverton to be a better way to say, let's do this. Um, sometimes some of, I think some, some things that come from Portland, people sort of roll their eyes from. So I try to look for other stuff. So if you ever have stuff that you see, um, I'd be super curious to see it. But I um, am kind of through several degrees of separation like Rep Bynum has a, has a chief of, I think it's a, her chief of staff, like very aware of the work that they're doing and really excited about what they've done. We just need to figure out how to get it, you know, into Beaverton so that we're also one in compliance and two building trust with um, our communities. I can't see raised hands, so feel free to pop in because I am on my cell phone. Yes, that's it. Um, I'd be happy to, um... I mean, it's pretty easy to find, uh, to get access to um, cities that already have programs and to find out what the feedback is like. So I can wander off and into the, you know, into the blogosphere and, you know, find that stuff out. Um, I'll, I think it'd be probably best to look for cities of, you know, 60 or 70,000 people. We um, have 100,000. Oh. Wow, we are we are a hundred. Yeah, yeah, we're a hundred thousand. And Spencer, if you would like, by no means do I want you to. I am sure that when Jenny gets here, she has done this before, and she will have something in mind. It will be interesting to see what council directs. And I, like I said, when I tried um, bringing it up with um, Kurt, he started talking about the logistics around building this border commission. And then I realized that there was going to be a lot more questions before they would be answered. Yeah, you're right. I'd forgotten she'd already done this. So maybe it's a good idea to wait till August. And it's just an observation on my part that it seems that when I ask a question, a what question, like, what do we want to do? That's a what question. Um, I get answers of, how it's not gonna happen or how it's complicated. If I ask a what question, I actually would like a what answer. And then how is a totally different thing. 
And I, I have found it a technique with people who don't really want to engage with me where they'll, they'll do that. They'll start with the, I'll start with a very specific question and they'll distract it into something so convoluted that reasonable people give up. Mm -hmm. And I just hope not to hear very much of that. I would also <laughs> add that this won't make anyone feel better, but even in the last month between the firework ban and the hiring of the city manager, we've just had so much. And so people have forgotten and that's not okay. And so it is okay to email and it is okay to call in and testify because because we do care. It's just hard with all of the things that we're trying to get done. It's not an excuse. It's just the reality of, of being part-time counselors in this city. Someone else was about to say something. I was just going to, to thank you because I, I really appreciate the, the extensive research that Spencer has done and in, in bringing this to light. And I, I think it will be a continuing dialogue um, I also know that our wonderful HR director, um, Patricia, is, is here and I, I wanted to make sure we were respectful of her time and also your time to be with your family, Kanzler Hassan, you're looking quite festive today. Um, but we, we really appreciate your connection to council and, and your advice as to how we can really be most effective and targeted. I will drop my email in the chat. I think y'all have it. Um, but if anything comes to mind, feel free to shoot me a note. Otherwise, uh, I will make sure to connect with Paolo on the cliff notes of tonight's meeting. Great. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Have a great celebration. Thank you. All right. Um, shall we move over? to our HR director. Thank you so much for making the space to be here tonight. I, I think that the thank you is from me to you to um, accommodate me at your meeting. I am so blessed always to be with HRAC. Um, we consider you partners and you have never disappointed us in giving us real candid, useful feedback for the things that we're doing. And I see a kitty there. Hi, kitty. <laughs> so I'm here to talk to you about Title VI and to make a request of you. So we have a Title VI program, which really is an anti-discriminatory program that um, is a federal law that prohibits any kind of discrimination on the basis of three protected classes. Um, race, color, and national origin. The city has um, a Title VI program. I can tell you Alexis Ball has worked very well. Years ago when Alexis was given this program, she was very new to Title VI and she has ensured that the city is kept compliant. We have a plan, we have a reporting structure. We work with Paula on the language access pieces to ensure that documents are um, um, translated into our seven target languages. And so we are now at a point where we are updating the plan. And in updating the plan, there are some new and better practices and, um, that we've been doing. So we've been trying to adopt both best practices and updating any federal requirements. One of the things that we recognize is that we need to have an advisory body. And so we're recommending that HRAC is the advisory body for the Title VI plan. And the Title VI plan um, really is about um, ensuring that the city in all its programs um, is understanding of the need to ensure that our subcontractors, our contractors, um, our employees, you know, in our dealings out, that nothing that the city does um, it disc is discriminatory, whether by intent or by accident um, against these protected classes. And how Title VI works is because it's one of the, the titles in the Civil Rights Act. You know, we have Title II, we have Title VII, we have Title IX, we have Title VI, we have all the titles. 
Um, and so we have Title III too, Title IV. So what happens is that with Title VI, it's very narrowly focused. But when a complaint comes into the city, we're not just going to say to the person who is either reporting um, the violation or the perception of that violation, or the person who is the recipient or on the, the, the end of you know, being the one who is feeling discriminated against because of what the city does. So when reports come in, we're going to say, okay, how do we handle these? What falls into the Title VI bucket? What falls into the Title II bucket? What is an employee related complaint that needs to go through the HR process? Mm -hmm. So we're going to manage those well, but we don't want anybody in the city to be chilled by not having a place to report any um, perception of discrimination as a result of the city's programs, services, or practices. So in, in coming to talk to you about this, I wanted to find out how HRAC felt about being closer aligned with the Title VI program and being a body that would advise us um, when we review our plans, when we update our plans, um, and we would also be giving you our annual report and ensuring that we have a body that can say to us, um, this is what we're noticing on the outside, or this is what we're hearing from the community, or helping us be proactive. This is what we really need to be doing. There's lack of education, if, that, if that's the case. Um, there's lack of understanding where to report, if that's the case. There's lack of response that we're hearing. This is the feedback we're hearing from the community. So that's why I'm here tonight and wanted to find out if you have any questions for me. And how do you feel about that? I only have 15 minutes, um, so I took seven, and I'm giving you seven. <laughs> and if you need me to come back, I'll come back. But I just asked, we asked Paolo for a, a little time with short notice. I, I think this is an exceptional request, and I, I, I won't assume to speak on, on everyone's behalf, but I, I believe that our response will be a unanimous yes. I mean, this, is, this is exactly the kind of space that we feel like we can be effective in. And um, I, I will, I will leave, leave it open for other people to comment. Are, is, is this something where we, when we receive the report that we are, are then taking space to digest that and then report back to you? How, how, would that, how would the process of that work? Um, we could develop that together, but what we, would be in, what we would want to do is to ensure that when we do the report um, and you read the report, because it would be coming from me, it's, and we would also have to send the report to ODOT annually, but it would be good to have a body that would be able to um, reflect with me on the report probably before the report comes out or before we have any incidents of, of reporting, be able to give me feedback as partners for the program to help us get better. That's what we really want to do, to help us mitigate faster, to help us get better in how we're, we're managing the, report, the, the, the program. So the report itself, when it comes to you, would be a factual report. It would be exactly what happened how many cases we were reported, how did we mitigate the time we took, um, you know, did we follow up, not follow up? So there are, there are certain benchmarks that we'll have to meet. When you get that report, if you see in it a trend of us not meeting those benchmarks, it would be a conversation that we would want to have. But I'm hoping that I would be smarter than that and I'd be coming to you to say, help me a track. I am seemingly not able to um, get people to um, follow through with a report or get a reporting party to follow through with a claim. Because sometimes people report to us, but they only say to us, for example, somebody might say, um, I am a, 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 a person from a national, another country and I am not finding um, a way to report discrimination. So that could be, be itself a report. My job 
is to research why that's happening. Is there a website accessibility issues? Do I need to partner with the ADA folks, the Title II folks, to say, let's think about website accessibility because my person over here who is reporting based on Title VI can't report because there's a barrier. So those are things that we would be um, looking at together in the report. The report is for you to digest, give me feedback, and you know, ensure that we're doing well. Hopefully we don't have things to correct, but if we do, it will be before then. This is really exciting. So it isn't only the report, it could even be an ongoing conversation if something came up in between the report that we would be able to be effective with that. Do I please? I'm asking you to be my partner. <sighs> we are so excited. I can so <laughs> my question is what is what is this thing you're asking us to is this a title six project no so title six is a law right that mm -hmm. requires us to have certain benchmarks we need and we're not very active alexis has done a really great job i have to tell you that so when you see her congratulate her um, but she just doesn't have the bandwidth for it but what Title VI is, is just a law that says, city, this is how you are to operate. You are to ensure that these notices are present, that every contract, every document you have that's outward facing, that provides services and programs, has these, these, um, that has this information. That pretty much says no person um, should be discriminated against and tells people where to report if they're discriminated against and tells them what to expect. So it's, it's something that we're already doing. It's just that in updating our plan, we see that there are some best practices we could adopt. And this is one of them. Having a partnership with an advisory board is one of those best practices. And I can tell you, I've, because I've worked with HRAC, and you know, HRAC is not an advisory to HR. Um, I thought it was in the beginning, but somewhere along it changed before I got here. So I still... Um, when I need you, still send things to you or come to you because I still consider your partner. But this would be a formalized structure where um, HRAC is an oversight body or a partnership body with the Title VI program. Excellent. I, I look forward to um, talking with the group a little bit more about it. And I, I, it it feels like an exciting opportunity to me. Joy, you have you have some more questions. You're very, very good at being discerning. Well, I could make the motion because we should be discussing it with the motion on the floor. Great, would you like to make the motion? Certainly, I make a motion that we work with the Title VI program with the city of Beaverton. Discussion. Well, I think we all know where I stand. Okay. There. <laughs> Do we need to call the question? Oh. I see a hand, Kathy. Kathy. I have a lot of questions. Um, and it's be because I worked in an institution where there was somebody who did this. And so um, she was the point person. If we were the advisory body, what kind of training would each of us need to become expert enough to do it? And would it be um, more efficient just to have an advisory group of two or three people who were very well trained, whom you whom were trustworthy, uh, instead of a big group like us. Um, I and we are volunteers. So what kind of time commitment would be part of this? Um, and would there be staff working with us because it is really a big, big job. 
So those are all my questions. And for myself, um, I'd like a long discussion about what it would look like, what it would require, and so on. It would require a lot for all of us to become experts, I think. So I can start, I can start by saying that um, I would definitely need to come back and spend some time with you so you understand the Title VI program. And we will be learning together as well. And, um, and so we have a Title VI document. I want to share with you very briefly, uh, my time is up. Can I get another two minutes? Yes. Okay. So I want to share with you very briefly the process. So the, the, the draft of the plan is done. We have to send it to ODOT. The plan just includes what the city is, is, is doing to prevent discrimination, what do we do in order to respond to reports of discrimination, and how do we um, do our checks and balances to ensure that those don't occur again. So that draft plan is being done. There's a Title VI plan currently on the website. If you go to the city side and just type in Title VI, um, Roman numeral five um, and, and the capital I, you will see the Title VI plan. As I said, Alexis has done a great job. Um, you would never believe that she's managing Title VI and all the other things that she's doing. So we have, um, we, we're going to go to city council um, in August to present the first draft of the plan. We're going to have a, a work session with them, go through the plan. And I've been working with a Portland State University student by the name of Max Wedding. And so we have updated the plan and the forms and all of that. Then we're going to have a two week comment period. And hopefully on September 14th, city council will adopt the plan. And the plan, the Title VI plan is, is very similar to the diversity, the diversity um, equity and inclusion plan. And, and Max was with you last month. Do you remember Max Wedding? Yes. yes. Very solid, very solid um, person who does solid work. I, I've met him before in my, other, in my previous job. We both worked together um, on, on several things, one of them including Title IX, which is concerning colleges and universities and schools. So we would be giving you, I would be coming to you and giving you training. There's a PowerPoint presentation that I have that I'll present to council. And I'd love to present that to you as well after I present it to council. And um, so I'm sure that Paula will help me. And then I will also be able to answer questions, walk us through. But to be honest, it's, it's not a lot that you have to learn. You just have to know that we're not, we, we cannot discriminate against persons and Title VI covers three basic areas, race, color, national origin. And you, have, you would need to learn where the forms are in case you need to go by themselves. So I will walk you through the website and I'm going to be working internally with several folks um, on deliverables and all of that. So I can send you all the information that you would need and um, invite you to be there at council as well. I don't believe it's going to take any additional time out of your day outside of your HRAC meeting, to be honest. And if it does, we would have to have a conversation because that should not be the intent. And, and I, you said you're volunteers, um, you know, you remind me of AmeriCorps. AmeriCorps does not use the word volunteers, they use the word members because folks come out every day um, to give their best. And it's, it's, it's something that if you were to take away from them, they wouldn't let go of. So I appreciate you for the fact that you have a passion um, that takes you into this space um, every day. So I know the city is very, very grateful. Thank you so much. Mercy, did you have a question you wanted to ask? I know Patricia's time is very limited and, and I, I think we're going to need to table this discussion because we have a lot of commentary and I think there's some rich conversation that we have to discuss here. Mercy? 
Well, my question wouldn't be going to her. I just said thank you for coming with that. I just wanted us to have a moment, like like Catherine said, and you initially measure. This is a very great opportunity to get involved with what is going on and the invitation. But it's it need time, like you said, you're gonna sit with us so we can talk about it. Um, and we need to know more about it. Like she's going to, the title says it's on the site. We're gonna look at it. I just think that it's very interesting that she will come to ask us to be part of it. But at the end of the day, we don't want to just say we will do it. Some of us like to really do stuff, but because we are so involved with so many things. So we need to just process it and see what is really going to be involved, just like everybody said. So before we come back to her. So I'm not going to really speak directly to her. I don't have a question, but I just want to say, let's come back to her and move on to the program. And then, you know, talk about it among us when yeah. there's no visitor. What, wise, wise perspective. And thank you for presenting us with this opportunity. We are looking forward to discussing it and, and getting back in touch where we have the privilege of having you back on. That will be wonderful. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you for having me here. And as I said, it, it should not be a lot of work for you. I don't even envision that there's going to be any work for you outside of me coming annually for a report. But my style is not to come annually. I'd want to come you know, at a time when you would like to hear what's going on to ensure that you know what's going on with the program. Well, th thank you again. We're, we appreciate the, the opportunity to consider this. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, Paolo, for making space for us um, despite a very packed agenda. Thank you, Patricia. We'll follow up. All right. Always good to see you all. It's always good to see you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you too. Stephanie? Yes. Before you restart, um, who seconded Joey's motion? No one. Stephanie. I'm sorry? No one. Oh. Perhaps perhaps you can put me down as seconding the motion. But Spencer, um, so I'll second the motion. But um, I mean, clearly we need to table this. Is there a process for tabling it, Joy? We just leave it on the table. OK, we're going to leave it on the table because we have Greg Brown here from the attorney's office. And um, we want to make sure we're respectful of, of his time. So, um, Paulo, is it okay if we, we move over to Greg and, and have him do his part and then return to, to the rest of our agenda after? Yeah, I think that'd be great. It was really cool to see uh, Greg sign on early because uh, we could go ahead and do that. And so great to see him. Thank you for coming, Greg. Cool. Thank you. Uh, you're absolutely welcome, folks. I, uh, it's a pleasure to be in front of you. Yeah, I could help provide a little bit of context. Um, Greg, thank you so much for being here. Um, so at last month's meeting, if y'all recall, there was quite a bit of discussion about the trespass agreement. Um, and y'all had uh, requested if we could have somebody from the attorney's office who could come and join the next ATRAC meeting. So I was just all across like knocking on their door and whatnot and talking to Abigail and we got Greg. I'm so grateful. Um, and Greg's here to answer some questions about the trespass agreement. Um, and yeah, uh, I'll let y'all take it away. Greg, if you want to go ahead and jump in. Sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, so uh, again, good evening folks. Uh, I, I figured I'd tell you just a little bit about uh, who I am. Uh, my name is Greg Brown. I am uh, one of the two city prosecutors uh, here at uh, the city of Beaverton. Uh, officially, I am within the city attorney's office. Uh, and in addition to uh, doing what you might call traditional prosecution work, um, uh, I also uh, provide legal counsel to various city departments. And so that includes uh, the Beaverton Police Department, uh, as well as certain sections of the uh, CDB, uh, as well as uh, anything else that the city really kind of needs me to do. Um, so I represent the city um, both in criminal court uh, and then also to, uh, if the city winds up in, in civil court, uh, I'm one of the trial attorneys. Uh, so I've been a lawyer for about five years. I, I went to law school at UCLA uh, and graduated in 2016, and then moved to 
family up here to Oregon. I'm from California. And uh, then uh, I've been a resident of Tigard for the last, well, since I've been up here. So there you go. Uh, so uh, I don't want to cut anybody off or, or, or sort of uh, deny or anything like that. Oh, goodness. Okay. Yeah, you keep breaking up. Oh, no. Well, that's no good. Uh, wonder. Here. You know what? I'm going to look like a big dork, but I'm going to put on a big pair of headphones that has a microphone on it. So maybe it'll, it'll be better for us. You can even take off your tie. It's okay. I'm, I'm on the clock. Uh, all right, so is that it's worse? How about now? Better? Worse? Now? On my end. Okay, all right. Um, so, you know, I won't repeat all of that. What I'll just say is I'm here because I'm one of the two city prosecutors. I work very closely with uh, Beaverton Police Department. Uh, I'm also uh, uh, part of the team that provides the Beaverton Police Department with legal counsel. Uh, my focus is more on trial work, um, but uh, I do a fair amount of advice work with um, Beaverton Police Department. Um, so that's everything from sort of weighing in on uh, certain contracts that they get involved in, uh, all the way through helping to supplement the uh, the training that they receive uh, through providing legal updates. Uh, I go to briefing, answer, do question and answer uh, sessions with the officers, basically do everything I can to make sure that the officers are in the field, um, really have a good understanding of uh, what the law is currently, as well as from my unique perspective as the person that's actually taking many of the cases that they refer to me all the way through uh, to trial. Um, so I don't want to cut anybody off or deny anybody's perspective at all. Um, so I would very much appreciate it if we could keep this uh, open-ended and if anyone has any specific questions I'm more than happy to address them sort of as they come up uh, you can just ask my wife it's very rarely uh, uh, difficult to get me to keep talking um, so <laughs> so please uh, jump in if you have questions uh, so um, I'm here to talk to you guys today about the trespass agreement program. Uh, I don't want to uh, go ahead and again stop anybody from saying anything, but I'm pretty well aware of uh, sort of what the context uh, is around this. I actually watched the uh, uh, meeting from last month, um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty well briefed on kind of what's going on, um, and I'm more than happy. Uh, I kind of put together a very brief like seven slide PowerPoint. I promise it's only seven sides, slides. Well, actually, hang on. Before, before I make that promise, let me see. Is it seven or is it eight? Oh my God, it's actually nine. It's nine <laughs> slides, in, including the, the, the title slide. So I hope I haven't lost credibility with you guys at this point. Um, but really I'm more than happy. Yeah. What's that? We would really love to see it. So yes, please, please. To start. All right. Is yeah. it? Let's just go ahead and do this. All right, we're gonna see if I can, if I have mastered the screen share uh, function on oh, Zoom at this point. It's up. a brave new world. <laughs> All right. Well, Looks that's... good, we can see it. Yeah, yeah, that sounds great. All right, perfect. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and minimize my video because I don't know how to do the presentation without you guys seeing my video and getting maybe a crazy mirror effect. So I'm gonna minimize that. Um, so I can't see if anybody has their hand up at this point. Uh, so uh, just jump in with audio if you have questions. Um, all right, so obviously we're here to talk about the Beaverton Police Department Trespass Agreement Program. Um, tonight, uh, basically I'm gonna go over three things with you sort of what is the trespass agreement program? What's the legal effect of a person in charge of a business entering into a trespass agreement with the uh, Beaverton Police Department, including what it does and what it doesn't do? Uh, and I'll talk to you just a little bit about sort of the scope 
of the program. But the bottom lines are really these. Uh, it's a program of limited but crucial scope that assists the Beaverton Police Department in protecting private property interests. So um, the key takeaway there is, is that this is a very limited program and it has an effect in just about 3% of trespassing cases. But the effect it has is critical because without a trespass agreement, um, we wouldn't necessarily have uh, the ability to protect the private property uh, interest of this particular business in, this, in these particular times. So it's one of those things that, yeah, it only affects 3% of the cases, but um, it's, it's a good 3%. Uh, the agreement itself has been reviewed by the CA's office. Uh, it was reviewed by um, one of the city attorneys before I got here, uh, and then I separately reviewed it myself before presenting to you. Uh, it, and I've actually enforced the agreement once or twice over my career as a prosecutor. Um, I wouldn't say that it is a linchpin program by any means. I describe it more as sort of a, a like the airbag in your car, okay? It's one of those things that you hope you never need it, but it's kind of a good thing uh, if you do end up needing it. Um, and from my perspective, uh, it appears that the agreements are being uh, lawfully applied by the Beaverton Police Department. Uh, another key sort of takeaway about the trespass agreement program is, is that the uh, participation in the program is wholly voluntary and it's freely revocable, okay? So it's a limited program of crucial scope. It's lawful, it's being lawfully applied as far as I can tell, and participation in the program is voluntary. So, the major points within the agreement is that it is an agreement between the lawful person in charge of the business and the Beaverton Police Department. Um, so I, I'm gonna wrap the phrase person in charge in quotation um, because that is what lawyers call a term of art. It has a specific definition it is specifically statutorily defined um, and it, it matters. Uh, so a person in charge is basically anybody who represents the business, okay? So it's a representative, employee uh, uh, of the person who has lawful control over the premises, whether that's by ownership, renting, whatever it is, that's a person in charge as defined by the law. So one of the things that, um, that is, is somewhat obvious, but um, I think kind of bears repeating, is when somebody is an owner of property, they have a certain, it's often described as a bundle of sticks that make up all of the different rights that you have in property. One of those rights, is called the right to exclude. And it is exactly what it sounds like. It basically says, look, absent certain exceptions, a um, business owner can exclude just about anybody that they want from, from the premises for just about any reason. But the exceptions are certainly important. So for example, a lot of, um, uh, a lot of businesses that are open to the public, uh, both in Oregon and throughout the, the nation, have um, restrictions on, for example, um, uh, uh, unfairly excluding or denying services based on you know, certain uh, 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 characteristics like race, sex, gender orientation in Oregon and a few other states, right? Um, but absent those exceptions, uh, property owners have the right to exclude people from their property. Uh, the agreement itself allows any Beaverton Police uh, Department officer to act as a person in charge of the property for the limited and sole purpose of excluding persons from the property if they violate 
a certain number of conditions. Okay. Um, it exists alongside the other persons in charge of the business. Uh, so just because a business owner enters into this agreement and says, you know, Beaverton PD, I like what's in this agreement. I would want somebody excluded from my property if they violated one of the criteria that, that um, I hope you guys have. If not, I can provide it to you. Uh, that is part of the agreement and I give you the authority to exclude them. That, that's really it. Okay. There are a few other provisions within the agreement, but that's sort of the, the, the bulk of what the agreement talks about. And that's what the, the, the intent of the agreement is. Um, oh, really quick, there was, I, I did receive the Word document um, that was prepared by the commission uh, that outlined some concerns. I think one of the concerns was why is the chief of police listed uh, on the trespass agreement? And that's because um, the Beaverton Police Department sort of acts under the authority of Chief Groshong. Uh, and because it is an agreement between the, the person in charge and the Beaverton Police Department, the agreement is being made on behalf of the chief, right? Because she is ultimately sort of responsible and, and bears the, the weight of, um, of the Beaverton Police Department uh, when it comes to entering into these agreements. Even if she was to enter into a contract or something like that, that contract is often entered into and signed by Chief Grishong on behalf of the Beaverton Police Department. So I know it looks a little bit weird and possibly a little bit intimidating to sort of list the chief's name on there. That's the reason why it's on there. Um, so let's see here. I think maybe I uh, jumped ahead in my presentation. Uh, so an officer uh, can issue an exclusion if and only if the officer has reasonable suspicion that a person on the premises has violated one of these things, okay? Reasonable suspicion is another term of art. Um, we could easily fill several days of a law school class talking about what reasonable suspicion is. Um, Suffice to say that the basic, the most basic definition of it is, is that it is a subjective belief on the part of the officer that is objectively reasonable under all the facts and circumstances. So often this comes up in criminal cases when a defense attorney argues that somebody was stopped without reasonable suspicion. Okay. Uh, that's a very common sort of motion that we end up uh, arguing. And so it has this subjective component to it that if it's challenged after the effect has to be objectively reasonable. Uh, this is a standard that the police officers are trained on. They know what it means They uh, because it factors into a lot of different aspects of their work. Uh, so that reasonable suspicion phrase is a working definition that officers are familiar with. And it's something more than just a hunch. It's mo something more than just, ah, uh, this guy looks shady, okay? Um, and the things that, can, that an officer can exclude somebody for includes if they violate any Oregon law. Uh, I know there was a note in there about sort of this seeming uh, legalistic, and I guess it kind of does, but when you're an attorney, you see something like ORS and it doesn't seem that weird. I totally get uh, that to a layman, uh, seeing something like that could, could appear to be a little weird, but I think the reason why it's abbreviated the way it is, uh, is because it can actually direct people to a, the definition of what a lot of these terms are. Um, so uh, in, o in uh, Oregon law, ORS stands for Oregon Revised Statute. Um, mostly it's gonna be the criminal code. Uh, which includes all of the crimes that you can think of. That's the criminal code. Um, the Beaverton City Code, the Beaverton City Code um, encompasses a bunch of um, ordinances, some of which are criminal in nature, some of which are civil in nature, um, and uh, has a few laws that it don't maybe exist at the state level, but exist at the municipal level. 
Uh, and then there are a couple of other criteria that can get you excluded. The agreement references this um, attached exclusion criteria that I hope you guys have. And again, I'm more than happy to provide it to you if you don't. Um, there was uh, a concern that maybe, well, if we don't spell out the exclusion document, you know, within the text of the signed agreement, uh, you know, how does anybody kind of know, or how does a court know uh, what the parties are going to talk about, or is it is a is a is a court even going to consider it? And the answer to that is is probably yes. So there is a concern about this thing called the four corners rule. The four corners rule is a concept in contract law that basically says in, in a contract dispute, uh, if there exists a final written version of an agreement, like a contract, um, that uh, is clear as to what the intent of the parties are, uh, the evidence in the case is often limited to the four corners of the final agreement. However, um, there are a bunch of different exceptions to that. One is where it's clear from the text of an agreement that the intent of the parties is to be bound by some other document, okay? So in this case, this references the attached exclusion criteria. You know, the agreement doesn't say we hereby incorporate by reference the the exclusion criteria spelled out in Exhibit One, uh, and the language there could maybe be 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 tightened up just a little bit. But in my opinion, this does a good job of um, being a little bit more straightforward than that being a little bit more readable than that. Uh, and then also as well, if somebody, if we ever wound up in litigation over the, the, the trespass agreement, I think any judge would looking at this would say it's very clear that they meant to reference in this other document. So while it's not the absolute perfect magic language, um, I think what it loses in specificity, it makes up for a little bit in readability, which is sometimes a good, which is sometimes a good thing. Um, the other major points there is, is that if the Beaverton Police Department issues an exclusion to somebody, that exclusion lasts for one year, unless a person in charge of the business tells. Beaverton Police Department otherwise. So that's a big thing under the agreement is even if an officer excludes somebody from the premises, at any point, the business owner is free to undo or overrule the uh, decision of the officer. Uh, it advises the person in charge that they may consult with their own legal counsel. Uh, and uh, that person can negotiate the terms of the agreement if they choose. Um, there are uh, a handful of trespass agreements that were actually negotiated with an attorney uh, and have um, their own sort of terms associated with them. Um, most of the time, um, the basic terms are, are what people end up with, um, but uh, certainly if there was a business who wanted to hire an attorney and say, hey, look, we want to do the trespass agreement program, but we have a problem with this specific term. Um, that's something that I would probably be tapped to negotiate with, with the attorney. But the whole mindset behind the trespass agreement program is, is that it's a service to the community um, that, you know, we're going to try to be as inclusive about as possible. Uh, and so, you know, unless there's a patently unreasonable request, like I'll only participate if you give me 5% of the, the, the city's tax revenue over the next 10 years, you know, then we might have a problem. But most of the time, um, we're very, very, very comfortable changing the language of the agreement. Um, the agreement can also be terminated at any time, the entire agreement. So if the business changes hands or the business owner just plain doesn't want to uh, deal with the trespass agreement program at all, uh, at any time, they are allowed to um, just terminate the agreement. And that, that ends, ends that, uh, that relationship. 
Uh, it clarifies that the person in charge is only delegating authority to exclude uh, and that they're not going to get any special services or favoritism from BPD, which is kind of a big, um, I, I guess I would call it an equity point uh, or a uh, clarifying point, which is just sort of like, you know, hey, look, just because you're de designating our officers as, as people who can exclude people from your premises, it, it doesn't mean that suddenly we're going to let you jump the line in the 911 call queue, right? And it's surprising that you would may maybe need to spell that out for somebody, but um, the agreement does that. Uh, and uh, finally, it protects the city in case of legal action on behalf of the business and arising solely based on the content of the agreement. I know there were some concerns uh, about some, um, uh, some of the uh, uh, protective clauses in the agreement. Um, and uh, I think the issues uh, like qualified immunity and things like that, a lot of that doesn't really apply to these facts. The, that's a doctrine that often um, arises in individual circumstances, uh, sometimes in city circumstances. Um, but uh, in a situation like this, um, this is really more of a contractual matter. And uh, even if there exists uh, a different doctrine that might be able to protect the city, it is absolutely best practice to make sure that we have overlapping areas of protection. Um, so what the agreement doesn't do, uh, it doesn't take anything away from the person in charge. That's the big part that the agreement tries to make very clear. So the person in charge retains the right to exclude persons from the premises themselves. So even though they are delegating the uh, power to exclude somebody from the premises, they're not losing it themselves. Uh, they are not losing uh, any right to be free of unreasonable searches and seizures without warrants. Uh, again, there were some concerns sort of raised about the ability of police officers to enter into property without um, uh, without a warrant. Um, that is another thing that could take a couple of weeks in a law school criminal procedure class. The basics of it are is, is that unless a well-recognized exception to the requirement that officers have to get a warrant exists, uh, they cannot enter onto premises without a warrant. Um, there are a few well-recognized exceptions, um, but from a practical standpoint, if I'm a prosecutor and maybe my ability to prove a case uh, hinges on our ability to get something from the business, and not only to get it, but to admit it in court, um, the best practice is absolutely to, to, to get a warrant. <laughs> and very often, um, the advice to, when you're a prosecutor to your law enforcement agency is simply get a warrant. Um, and certainly nothing in this trespass agreement uh, absolves officers of, of needing to get a warrant. Again, unless one of the exceptions applies, but having participating in the trespass agreement program is not an exception to the warrant requirement. Um, doesn't take away anything about the right to govern the affairs of the business. As I said earlier, um, the business can always undo an exclusion and can completely leave the program at any time. Uh, and they still receive usual and ordinary police services. So even though we're not going to let you jump to the first spot in the line, uh, if there are several calls for service before you and we are beyond our capacity for officers out on the road, um, you know, we're also not taking away your police service if you participate in the program. Uh, or conversely, if you don't participate in the program, if you still called 911, an officer is going to show up to your business. Um, so I think there's maybe some terminology here that, that also is contributed to, to what's going on, which is, okay, this is called the trespass agreement program because of 
the sort of common lingo in the law enforcement community regarding what it means to uh, trespass somebody from a business. When we talk about trespassing somebody, what we're doing is we're really putting that person on notice that if they return to the business, they could be subject to arrest for trespassing. So to trespass somebody or to exclude somebody from the property, all it means is, is that you're getting a heads up that if you come back to the property, you might get arrested for trespass. Um, so if even if somebody is excluded from property, um, it doesn't always mean that there, there's going to be a trespassing charge. In fact, um, anecdotally, based on the vast majority of cases that I read every day, um, uh, the, when somebody's arrested for trespass, there is a long history of it being documented that they were told several times that they can't be on on the property that the business owner didn't want them there for whatever reason um the exclusion is typically recorded by the officer issuing the exclusion uh, so it can be related in a later police report um, as a prosecutor right i am more concerned if somebody has trespassed on a property seven times than i am if somebody told them to leave the property and they didn't wait 10 minutes for them to leave the property Okay. Um, and officers are really good about recording their exclusions so that we know who's excluded and so that they can tell me what the history of the case is. Um, if an excluded person returns to the property, they can be arrested for criminal trespass too. Uh, criminal trespass too is a shorthand way of saying criminal trespass in the second degree. Um, there are several ways to commit cr tr criminal trespass in the second degree. Uh, one of them is if a person enters or remains unlawfully in or upon premises, uh, enters or remains unlawfully is uh, separately defined. Uh, it includes about four things, but the two most common are to fail to leave premises that are open to the public after being lawfully directed to do so by a person in charge, or to enter premises that are open to the public after being lawfully direct, uh, directed not to enter the premises. Um, so there's sort of a chain that goes from exclusion to a later arrest for trespass. But if you get excluded from the property and you abide by the, by the exclusion and you don't return to the property, um, you're not arrested for trespass. Uh, the scope of the program is very limited. Uh, so I said that it's limited to crucially applicable situations. Uh, it protects business owners in two primary situations. So the first one is someone on the property that the business owner would want to exclude uh, and the person in charge can't be located. Again, the business owner retains the right to go ahead and exclude people themselves. So if the business is open, um, a business owner is free to exclude somebody, right? But a business owner who is participating in the trespass agreement uh, program has told Beaverton Police Department, if you find somebody on my property and they're violating one of those criteria, go ahead and exclude them. So basically, the trespass agreement program really protects a business after it's closed. Uh, and the hypothetical I like to use is this. Um, if somebody enters into a business, even if uh, they are clad all in black with a ski mask and they're carrying a duffel bag marked burglary kit, if that person enters into a business that's been left unlocked, for example, by, a, by an employee, um, and they haven't committed any other crimes, and, and an officer goes ahead and finds them sort of in this preemptory position where I think almost anybody would assume that this person is reasonably up to no good. However, if there isn't a trespass agreement uh, on file and the person says, yeah, the business gave me uh, uh, permission to be here, the officer cannot arrest that person because they haven't committed any crimes. 
if they didn't break anything when they entered into the uh, business because they entered in through an unlocked door and all they're doing so far is just standing in the business, um, an officer can't arrest because that person hasn't committed any crime. And also, if the officer doesn't have any reason to believe that uh, the person is not associated with the business, so if they say, oh yeah, I know Joe Smith who owns the business, he told me I could be here, an officer can't arrest that person unless there's a trespass agreement on file. And the officer can't even really tell that person to leave the premises and don't come back tomorrow looking for the same unlocked door. Um, that's where the trespass agreement comes in. Because even though we can't find somebody who's associated with the business, if the business owner has said, hey, look, if you find somebody on my property after a close of business and they're there for more than 20 minutes and they don't have any other lawful authority to be there, go ahead and exclude them from the premises. And that's it. And if the person leaves voluntarily, um, at that point, even if they're standing there black clad with a ski mask and a burglary kit, uh, they're, not, they're not typically arrested. Um, and then the other way that it uh, makes sense is when the relationships or structure of a business make identifying a person in charge difficult because the person in charge of the business um, maybe isn't there or they have a bunch of independent contractors working for them, or there is a, um, uh, a sort of central, for example, shopping center or management for a large apartment complex. Um, it can make finding out who the actual person in charge is very, very, very difficult. And there was a case I had a few years back, uh, actually at the Washington County District Attorney's Office that happened at a McDonald's. There was a, um, uh, a white supremacist who came into the McDonald's and started chanting uh, racial screeds. Um, it was terribly upsetting for everybody involved. He used uh, a lot of um, racial slurs towards the uh, people of uh, uh, Latinx origins who worked there. Um, but he didn't issue any direct threats. He didn't really kind of do anything other than just yell and make a lot of noise. Because a police officer happened to be in the restaurant um, or come into the restaurant pretty pretty soon after that, the police officer is able to go ahead and exclude that person from the business right away without having to stop and wonder whether the fry cooks or you know the shift manager or whomever else is there um, really has the authority to exclude this person, and that. Uh, ultimately is the sort of other component of this. Um, and to give you an idea of how limited it is, there are 573 uh, trespass agreements on file with Beaverton Police Department right now. Of the last six months, BPD has arrested 140 people for trespassing. 5% of those cases involve trespass agreements. So stated another way, about 97% of the trespass cases out there were because a business owner trespassed somebody, not because the police trespassed somebody. Again, it is a program that is of a limited uh, scope that applies in some certain situations, but in the situations where it does kind of apply, um, I think our business owners are kind of glad it's there. Uh, and that's it. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? I know we have a very um, limited time um we may be sending you follow-up questions that um this was this was very extensive and we appreciate the the thorough legal analysis um, but i'm certain that there are going to be a lot of questions i'm happy to address those questions um if you want to get something uh over to uh, mr esteban i'm more than happy to uh, answer those by email um and uh i also 
am more than happy to just sort of go through that Word document that I received, um, just sort of point by point and clarify as needed as well. That's, that's also something I'm happy to do for you. Thank you so much, Greg. We really appreciate your willingness to be available and to explain the 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 legal aspects of this. There's it's it's yeah. I feel like I just entered a law class. <laughs> Welcome to my world. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. I I know there will be additional discussion. I um our our time is 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 getting shorter and shorter, but um. Thank you for coming and we will, um, we will de definitely be following up with you. Thank you again for your time. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Greg. Bye. I wanted to make sure that we also retain space for, for Britt, um, the community safety um, work where we're doing the community art project. Uh, I, I know you and Dory have been working on that and I, I want to make sure that we make time to see that some of the other items we may have to table. Um, Brett, would, would you, I, I know it's quite an awkward transition here because my head is full of ideas and questions about the trespass agreement, but I, I wanna make sure we make space for, for all of the work that you've done in the last month too. Yeah, I'm happy to um, talk about it. I thought Sabi was going to be here as well because um, I know that she was able to attend the last meeting, which I couldn't be at. Um, but Dory did send around a couple updates, um, just basically highlighting um, that we're finishing up yesterday. Um, we should have gotten all of the feedback from just our group of people working on the subcommittee for the questions. Um, so we did get some feedback from the Beaverton Police Department on those, as well as I believe some other feedback from the group of us working on it. Um, I did not get any updates about those specific comments. Um, so I'm not sure I know that I sent my thoughts to Dory. Um, and then we are, I guess, reviewing the artists starting tomorrow. Um, there was no actual date associated with it, but it, this was sent to me yesterday. So I believe it's this Thursday that the artist will be reviewed. And then um, Sabi, I believe is also looking at locations. I know that I did recently get an update. Let's see if I can go back in my email. Mm -hmm. I think Britt, as you're looking for that, yeah, Sabdi is um, looking for uh, locations and really events where it would make sense to pop up this art, art, art project and collect feedback from folks. Um, one of the things that I just heard earlier, um, Lieutenant Sellingworth, I, I, I know for those um, uh, 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 officer night outs, I'm sorry, you said it earlier. National night out. National night outs. I'm wondering if that might be an opportunity or a place for this uh, for these projects. Um, Lieutenant Sellingworth has also been really helpful in uh, attending those meetings as well, so. Well, I, I don't, functionally, I don't know, Paul, because, um, like I said, we're not we're not hosting the events. I guess if there's a neighborhood that that decides they want to do it. I, I suppose that might be a possibility, but you'd have to we'd have to know who the neighborhood is. And then somebody from HRAC would have to reach out to that neighborhood and say, we have this program. We'd like to try this. So there's there's a lot of things that would have to happen, I think, in the, this kind of model I'm talking about um, without it being the uh, like library or city park or anything like that. Thank you. Um, yes. So the only other thing that we had been discussing, which I think uh, Dory wanted us to bring to you all, was um, if you guys had any last feedback about questions one and questions three. Um, there were two different versions that we had been working with. So the first for question one, um, which I don't know if somebody, or I can copy these into the chat actually. Um, so the first one is what does a safe community for all people look like? And then the other version is what does a safe community mean to you? Um, so we we're discussing what the like connotation and difference between those is. And then um, the other was for question three, um, which we were just solidifying what are those two. Um, so what, or how can we work together to make our community safe and how can we as a community work to keep the community safe um so just a slight language difference there um but those were the last two questions that we were solidifying those were, those were in your notes right 
in the what room. Was that? Those were in your minutes. Um, I believe yeah, so. I it was in an there. email that I got from Dory. I think it was attached to the, this agenda in the last minutes and things like that. It should, it should all be in there. Perfect. It looks like this. Mm -hmm. So yes. it's three or four pages, and then I think it's the third page. Oh, fifth page in. Dory included page numbers. What do we need to do to finalize those questions? Um, I think uh, in her last email to the group, um, it was basically just uh, discussing sort of what, what the connotation is and what our goal is. Um, so for the first one, um, she wrote, what does a safe community for all people look like? Um, this question asks folks to consider and imagine what would make a safe community for all members of the community. Whereas what does a safe community mean to you? Asks folks to consider what the ideal safe community means to them specifically. Um, so it centers the person's perspectives of a safe community rather than thinking more generally. Um, so sort of those small changes of how specifically what we want to ask that question and what feedback we'd like to get from folks. Can we, can we have people email um, and Brett and Dory and Sapi for their, their responses and or whatever they don't receive, make a decision on that? How, how would we like to handle it? Because it seems like we need to solidify um, what those answers are going to be. And if, if there's opinions right now, then, then we should express those. Lieutenant Stellingworth? Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Britt, but I think, isn't that what the meeting for Friday is at 4.30? I think we're having a meeting. Uh, yeah, so there is a meeting Friday at 4.30. I will not be there um, because I have another appointment, but um, I believe that that is going to be like our final meeting to basically say, yes, this is what we're moving forward with. Um, and then since the artist will start being reviewed tomorrow and with Sabi's research, I think that Friday is really going to be the critical like this is our plan moving forward, how we're going to do it. Great. Spencer. Feedback in this space for sure. And I, I'm more than happy to share it. I'll be at that meeting. Perfect. Um, Britt, do you guys want any input on how to ask questions specifically to younger children? I noticed there was in the minutes, there was some, um, the minutes were a little fuzzy around that issue. Yeah, I think that our intention is to have uh, questions that are the most accessible. Um, this was part of my feedback that I did give to Dory about the suggestions that we got. Um, so for the second version of the third question, um, I suggested if we were going to go with that one, we add commas to make it uh, read more clearly um, to somebody whose first language may not be English. Um, but that is a concern that I did bring up to her is how we make it to where anybody who is in this space could access the questions. Um, I don't know that we've specifically talked about it. I wasn't in the last meeting, so I don't know if anything else was discussed. I don't know if Kathy was there. Um, she may have more information on that specifically. Yes, this was the most accessible that we came up with and would definitely appreciate input, Spencer. There were so few of us wrestling with this. How would you like the input? You could email it right now or put it in the chat. If it's going to be short input, just put it in the chat and I'll copy it down on my copy of it or you could call and talk about it. However, you think your input could best be communicated. Okay, I'll probably email, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I would say email will probably be the best. I know that Dory is still traveling, um, right. so. I think there was another question there. I think, Britt, you mentioned the accessibility piece. Um, we There is a plan too to get the, uh, card whenever it's ready, translated in the seven priority languages uh, here at the city. So.
Great. I, it's, it sounds like um, we have a final opportunity to put in some input. So please do so if you have some and get that information to Britt and the team on the community art project. And, and then they, they will finalize that, it sounds like, in a couple of days at their next meeting. Correct, Britt? My apologies. I was reading Amy's question. Uh, what was your question? Oh, that, that it will be finalized at your next meeting. So people should get their input in soon. Yes, if you have feedback that you would like to give us, I would say do that by end of day, probably tomorrow or very early on Friday. I know that the team is meeting at 4.30 Friday afternoon. Great, and I, I did notice Amy put in some suggestions and I also wanted to draw attention to Lisa's also um, family story time um, on the lawn at the library. So, so it sounds like there's some potential locations that we can consider and we, um, we know that will be in your capable hands and start to be addressed. I mean, I'm particularly excited to hear about the um, artists that you'll be looking at and hearing how that continues to evolve. So thank you so much for that update. That's, that's really, um, really helpful. And then um, I wanted to, to go over to Joy also because you have an update about council and our progress with them. Right, so at the last city council meeting that they had, which was not yesterday, it was the week before, they had a round table discussion and about an hour into the meeting, they took up our recommendations. And as Councilor Hassan um, said, she tried to read them into the record. And that um, did not, happen and uh, I have lots of things to say and it's been my feedback from um, from city councilors and from other people around them that it does make a difference when we show up and speak at the public comment part especially if we got together or not together, if we, um, several of us talked about our recommendations that they're not taking up, haven't taken up six months in. So my thought was that it, I would encourage you to watch that city council discussion about our recommendations, at a, it starts at about one hour, one hour three. So you start at one hour, 57 minutes, somewhere around there. And it doesn't go for that long. And if there was something that you wanted to say to any of those people, um, if you could let me know, that'd be great. Just so I could coordinate and tailor my comments to kind of tie things up at the end. Um, that would be very welcome. It makes a difference when we speak. So I don't know who saw that roundtable discussion. Let me encourage you. You want to, not for good reasons. In my humble opinion, and I'm completely biased. Tanya. Uh, it looks like we have, uh, Tanya and Spencer, are y'all uh, raising your hands to speak at one of these next Tuesday meetings? Okay, I saw a nod from Tanya. I was just going to second what Joy just said. Um, if I could speak truth and use epithets, um, it was a blank show. It oh. was unbelievable. What day is that? What date of council last week or Tuesday 5 30. Yes but the one that you're saying review which one was that? Not yesterday so it's the last day of June. The last June okay thanks. Kathy. Thank you. Um, I feel pretty strongly that um, as individuals, many of us have reminded the council 
of these recommendations. And I do think it's time, I'm hoping that HRAC will send an official letter to them, reminding them. And I think it would have more strength than us speaking as individuals because our individual voices have not seemed to make a difference. Although at the last council meeting, they did say things like, well, HRAC is wanting us to get moving on this. Um, and so I think that an assertive letter from HRAC would have more impact. We haven't had much impact. So should we resend our recommendations to the city and say, hi, in case you forgot, we're here, we're waiting. I would send our dismay and um, even ask them to do their work on it. And I would send Spencer's list also. <coughs> they have been one of the recent meetings. They asked, they said, we need a report about what the legislature has done. And I was a bit surprised because to me, it sounded like no one on the council had done that work. Yeah, to I was see dismayed. What the legislature had done. And right. the list from Spencer is easy, falls into their lap, and it can be said, here you go. Uh, we can. We can be assertive, but not be rude about it. That's, I mean, we do not want to be rude. We do not want to be no. conflict. No, then they'll but, stop listening. Yeah. Yes, but I really think it's time, <coughs> excuse me, for HRAC to make a united voice again. <coughs> <coughs> Do you want to make a motion? I move that HRAC create and send a letter to the city council regarding the recommendations on policing. And I do, and more than a reminder. I would second that. Uh, Any discussion? Is there somebody, so it looks like it passed, let me second. Is there anybody who would like to? And now it's open for discussion. It yeah, hasn't it been open. voted. Now we can talk about it. Okay. I <coughs> want to that we're, we are three minutes over, but that is something that, um, totally, I'll take it away. <laughs> Kathy, would you like to put together a draft? I would do it with a couple of other people. Um, I know that Lisa is very good at wordsmithing. Does, who else? Cameron, she really course, is, yeah. Yes, Cameron, of course, is a lawyer, but um, maybe somebody from the executive council. Spencer has a lot of experience. The thing is that it's my opinion that everybody on this HRAC advisory board is really good with words. And so maybe people should just volunteer. Lisa, that sounds great. Yeah, Lisa's, Lisa's saying in the chat, if you're not reading it, Kathy, that, she, that if you write a draft, she would be happy to retool it and wordsmith it. So I think that's probably where we need to leave it right now because we're already five minutes over our time. Um, and then we will have a, we have a lot of things to vote on. We have Patricia's um, suggestion to our, 
our commission. We we have um, Kathy's recommendation, which um, to the council, and we we have a few things that we've missed on the agenda this time, including um, Spencer's resources and and announcements that he has. He's been such a fantastic resource with that, but. Um, we're, we're going to need to to come to a close right now. Spencer, was there any last second things? I, I, I'm so sorry that we're we're kind of cutting you short on this. Is, is Are some of these things we can table for next time or is there something immediate that we cannot miss? There are only two things, the legislative information I sent out and that horror show of an article from uh, BBC that Kathy sent out about um, how police are trained in the United States. That's it. Thank you so much for alerting us and being so efficient um, with with our time. I, I highly recommend that we we pause for those resources. Um, clearly, the, uh, you know our our team has to regroup and make sure we get a few of these items back on the agenda. Um, the community agreements we will revisit. Um, next month and if you have a chance Paolo set those out today and we can review those but thank you for an extremely packed and productive meeting today we we certainly got a lot of intake and we'll be making a lot of decisions um, in our forthcoming meetings so thank you again i appreciate your time this evening we'll talk to you later good night